going to get this going. We have a lot uh, to talk about a lot. We're going through um, uh, on this really jam packed webinar. Um, but thank you guys so much for taking the time. I can't say this enough, taking the time out of your Wednesday to be here with Elliot and I joining this conversation. Um, it's going to be super fun. I'm, I'm really excited for this November's um, webinar, but throughout you guys know the drill. If you are new, however, um, then I hope that throughout this time you'll put your questions and your thoughts in the chat. This is a community. We're all here just to have a good time. So please, if you haven't already, name where you're from and where you'd like to visit um, that you haven't yet and it's on your bucket list. So let's get it going. If my face does not look familiar to you, my name is Bailey Ritter and I hope we become good friends really quickly. Um, but I'm originally from Pontiac, Illinois, and the place that's on my bucket list that I've yet to go is Fiji. Um, and I remember reading about it in a Magic Treehouse book. Um, I was obsessed with that, that series as a kid and they went to Fiji and I was like, this sounds like an entire another, this is not on planet earth. Like this has to be another place, which is what I'm kind of thinking about all of the places that you guys put in the chat. Um, but I'm the youth advisor for the ocean project, which I definitely implore you to check out both world ocean day and the ocean projects website um, to see how else you can get involved. If these kinds of topics interest you. Um, but if you're just interested in, in joining this global youth movement um, to protect and take care and take action of our shared food planet. Um, I'll kind of put at the end how you can get more involved um, with both of that, uh, the Ocean Project and World Oceans Day work, um, but I did want to just have a quick shout out there. But enough about me. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to introduce you all to my November Rise Up webinar co-host, Elliot Connor. Um, he is going to explain a little bit about his work um, and a little bit more about himself in general, but Elliot is the founder and CEO of Human Nature Projects, an international environmental NGO supporting volunteers from over 105 countries. He's a TEDx speaker, which we just talked about <laughs> before we started the webinar, podcast author, um, podcast host, author, animal rescuer, photographer, filmmaker, um, with the goal of reframing our human relationship with nature. I'm literally going to be the MC only because Elliot has just a wealth of knowledge, is a wealth of knowledge, and has so much amazing experience perspective that um, I can't wait for you all to um, get in on. Um, but as always, please, if you have any questions, any thoughts for Elliot, anything that you want to ask either of us, please put those in the Q&A box. I put it up top, but I think it's at the bottom for you all. <laughs> at the bottom, the Q&A box or the chat. Um, you know, we'll be asking and take some time at the very end for questions. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Elliot to introduce himself. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Bailey so eloquently said, I'm Elliot. I run Human Nature Projects, have done uh, for the past 18 months. Uh, I currently am living in Sydney in Australia, uh, but originally uh, from the UK, as you may be able to tell from the accent. Uh, I do quite a range of things, uh, as, as you may have gathered, uh, but I guess my story really starts about two years ago now. So almost two years ago when things really started picking up and at that time, I was volunteering at a uh, rescue and rehab center for injured wildlife in southern France. Uh, so I was over there for about a month in, it was near the French Alps, so very remote, almost no internet connection, uh, nobody for miles around, uh, lots of snow, lots of uh, birds of prey, uh, hedgehogs, bats, you name it, uh, that I was looking after. Uh, but I had uh, this moment, and it was quite a pivotal time for me, uh, doing lots of background research into uh, the environmental space more generally, uh, how I could get involved in that, uh, especially on that wider scale, so globally. Uh, but I had this moment uh, when I was doing a vulture release. So it was one of my absolute favorite animals, and I've continued to do 
animal rescuing in the uh, several years since. Uh, I've currently got a butcher bird out back uh, who is absolutely adorable. Uh, but we were doing this vulture release, a uh, griff vulture, which we'd had in for about a month. Uh, so almost the entirety of my stay there. And uh, we were up on this precipice of the Alps, uh, looking down uh, thousands of meters below. Uh, and we opened uh, the door of the dog kennel, uh, it flew out majestically, beautifully, soaring up onto the thermals uh, to join dozens of others circling overhead. And yeah, I, I just stood back and thought very, very clearly, uh, what if everyone can experience this? Uh, so uh, that thought has stuck with me ever since. And what I've been trying to do with human nature projects is uh, take down some of those barriers uh, so the youth especially uh, can uh, live that dream of saving the planet, uh, but do so in a sustainable, uh, empowering manner uh, and uh, do so regardless of their circumstances, uh, their culture, uh, their language, country, background, experience, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's how it really all started for me. Obviously, I've had a long standing interest uh, in nature. I've been very, very privileged uh, to have some incredible opportunities uh, just since starting Human Nature Projects. Uh, so mid last year, uh, I've, as Bailey said, uh, spoken at the TEDx stage, uh, done various international keynote speeches, uh, shared plenty of thoughts, uh, come up with new constructs, philosophies about how we can uh, try and reimagine environmentalism, conservation, uh, all that jazz. Uh, earlier this year, before COVID came around, I did a four-week internship uh, filming live safaris in South Africa. Uh, so that's, I guess, where I'm headed long term, moving into wildlife filmmaking. Uh, but actually, on the first day I was over there, it was Christmas Eve uh, when I arrived in the camp. Uh, so, yeah, uh, all the staff uh, went out for a special Christmas Eve game drive uh, night spotlighting safari. And I was on the front of the bonnet. It's called the tracker's seat. Uh, so just very, very basic setup. Uh, no seat belt, no nothing. <laughs> Hanging on for dear life as we... Uh, went forward driving on a very rough terrain uh, but we came across a pride of lions on the hunt so the lionesses of course and uh, the way lions hunt is if i can do it by, by zoom uh, so you have essentially a crescent shape of the lionesses uh, which are herding uh, the prey in this case impalas antelopes uh, so they're doing that and we spotted one of them on one of the wings we drove up over here to where the Impala were uh, and we turned off all the lights and waited. So I was there crouched at the front of the bonnet and uh, uh, we heard uh, suddenly the Impala started running and then because uh, they'd taken down uh, one of the Impala rams about five meters uh, from where I was sitting. Uh, so there's this crescent of lions and then one just waits in ambush over here and it happened to have been almost where we parked our car. So yeah, that was another incredible experience for me, uh, but very much uh, that's the sort of work I'm hoping to do long-term. Currently doing lots of marketing roles, uh, communications, I guess my passion is for storytelling. Uh, so being able to uh, share via written articles, uh, videos, um, public speaking, things like that. Uh, but that's what I love most. And uh, the place I haven't been to yet, apart from all the ones uh, which you mentioned. And uh, yeah, I've been to Borneo. I don't think I've made it any of the others. I was going to go to Japan this year, uh, but that got called off, uh, ditto India. Uh, so the place where I'd love to go is Madagascar. Uh, I'm absolutely enamored with Africa, uh, being all around Southern uh, regions, uh, but Madagascar I haven't made yet. Uh, so incredible endemic uh, fauna and flora, uh, some wonderful, wonderful charismatic species, especially from a 
filmmaking perspective, the lemurs, chameleons, uh, underwater life as well. Uh, so that's one place I would definitely go. I don't know about any of you watching this, but I'm about to create a petition to have Elliot narrate the next planet Earth because the way that you speak, <laughs> I think, you know, you can just feel your passion for, you know, all of the places and all of the species and the people that you've been able to work with, um, collaborate with, and ultimately, you know, help share and tell their stories. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about the actual work of Human Nature Projects? You know, what is the mission, vision? Um, what are you guys hoping to achieve? Sure. So Human Nature Projects started as essentially a community within conservation. Uh, my experience prior to that had been uh, mostly on the local scale. So volunteering with a uh, dozen, two dozen local organizations, activist groups, grassroots, naturalist clubs, uh, etc., cetera, uh, land care, you name it, uh, but trying really to make a difference. And I found that very challenging. Uh, I think part of it was being minor. So uh, as another hoop, more red tape uh, uh, to cross before uh, you can then get involved. Uh, but essentially uh, many of these organizations really struggled uh, to engage uh, especially new volunteers so people who didn't have experience skill set uh, which may be useful to them and human nature projects was trying to circumvent that uh, so uh, essentially allowing this grassroots model uh, which environmentalism is uh, we started uh, with groups like the rspb with the silent spring with america's uk uh, Europe all coming together as communities uh, to address these challenges but finding a way of scaling that uh, in a way which kept that really lovely feel and uh, kept that tailored uh, experience for the volunteers uh, so yeah uh, that was the intention behind it and uh, as you say it's gone really well uh, so we've now got members in over 100 countries is set up on the two levels. So we've got national teams, uh, which are engaging with our volunteers on that local scale still. Uh, so they're able to work on projects which are really relevant to their communities. Uh, they're able to really shape that discourse. Uh, often they'll step up to run uh, various aspects of the national teams. Uh, it gives them that leadership role, that responsibility, but also uh, that chance to uh, save the world in a way which they can shape so uh, in a way uh, which they are really passionate about uh, second level being the international working groups uh, so those are aligned according to interest or skill sets and they allow volunteers to meet with people across all these different countries globally uh, which is one of the parts of my job i love most uh, but it's a really great opportunity to uh, create some larger projects initiatives so uh, like, for example, we've recently uh, launched an educational toolkit. So uh, creating this program to help launch school clubs, uh, giving teachers that support, mentorship, but also the resources to do that, uh, to sustain it and help uh, teach kids about nature in a really energizing, innovative way. Uh, so that was designed uh, through one of our working groups, uh, but we've got uh, about a dozen of those. Uh, so that's some of the uh, high level of what Human Nature Projects does, uh, but essentially it's just a space for nature lovers, environmentalists uh, to connect and to uh, create change in the world. That's awesome. I really love that. The other, while you were speaking, it just made me think kind of back to the theme of this month's webinar and that's redefining sustainability. You know, I think a lot of us generationally, we have different definitions, people to people, we have different generation or different definitions. So I guess what is the 2020 definition for Elliot Connor of sustainability? And, you know, how do you put that into practice every day? You know, whatever that definition looks like for you. Yeah, isn't that a question we wish we could answer? <laughs> In terms of yeah, sustainability, I mean, it, it really is that tough word to pin down. It's become almost a buzzword in the past decade. 
uh, companies moving towards sustainable practices. What does that mean uh, in the long term in terms of how you measure that? Uh, but for me, sustainability is more about values. So uh, a large component of what Human Nature Project stands for uh, is reframing our human relationship with nature. So trying to look at our human species from a uh, objective standpoint, uh, trying to distance ourselves, uh, look at what our place in the planet is and should be. And uh, that can create some really interesting uh, paths moving forward. Uh, so I spent six weeks of lockdown here in Australia writing a book about the very subject. Uh, what are humans? Uh, how have we related to other animals? How is that changing? How will that change in the future? Very interesting question. Uh, but for me, sustainability is trying to show other animals uh, dignity, respect, compassion, uh, all of those things, and uh, recognizing uh, the inherent rights of nature to exist, uh, to uh, thrive. And uh, instead of having this uh, almost outdated model of conservation, so restoring nature to some past ideal and who knows what that's meant to be uh, but trying to work with nature supporting it restoring it and uh, trying to make sure uh, both nature and humans uh, can have this optimum uh, position uh, moving forward uh, so the logistics of that are really challenging and if we could solve that uh, we'd solve many of the challenges uh, facing the world today uh, but just recently i was doing some research across about 150 countries. So most countries in the world uh, looking at correlations between their development. So the HDI and environmental sustainability. So a mixture of metrics, but indicators, uh, red list, uh, IUCN uh, data, uh, so threatened species, uh, various indicators of performance on that. And it's really interesting because there's no correlation whatsoever uh, you get these graphs where uh, it's, it's like a sea with debris floating upon it. Uh, so uh, big bubbles where you have the huge, uh, well-developed, uh, very rich countries are all drought, as are the tiny bubbles uh, where you've got uh, countries which are very poor, uh, very low affluence, very low development uh, rating or score. Uh, so they often can do just as well or better uh, than some of the big big countries in this space. Uh, Australia has the third most threatened species, I believe uh, US number two. Uh, so yeah, uh, that gives you an indication of uh, just how strange this playing field we're working on is. And I think if we can redefine sustainability as uh, some of what I mentioned, so uh, being able to live alongside with in conjunction with nature, uh, then uh, that might start to change uh, because uh, we're looking at economic practice, uh, social practice, cultural practice, uh, which can really reinforce and uh, prop up, support nature in a way which is beneficial for both parties. So uh, that's some of what sustainability could or might mean, uh, but it's a tough one to tie down, especially with this shifting baseline we've got. And especially in 2020, I think, you know, this was supposed to be kind of the major year for a lot of environmental movements. I think 2019 was really exciting yeah. because it was sort of like this building of a movement and momentum. And then 2020, we're like, okay, this is going to be it. And then boom, <laughs> you all have to slow down a little yeah. bit. Um, so yeah, I totally relate to kind of the shifting, okay, what kind of shifting playing field, shifting uh, baseline, where are you at? You know, what can you operate with? But I think for me, it's been really exciting during a global pandemic. Not that there's much to be excited about during a global pandemic, but the way that that momentum has in a lot of ways continued, I think is really mm. inspiring to me, you know, and, and really, I think a lot of us are reshifting our values as well. What, it, what does it mean to be someone in this space you know what are our values are we keeping true to those though so i think that's those are all really good points to bring up do you feel that so i'm sure people perhaps watching because i think when i first you know started grappling with these concepts the the term sustainability and you know what that truly means it just felt so long term like it just felt like that is like <laughs> we're talking about 
decades until we can achieve this. What, what do you do to kind of speak to that notion of working hand in hand with nature every single day? You know, what are things that people who really resonated with that can do say tomorrow? I think the issue with the way we're framing sustainability or conservation or environmentalism more generally is you're right, we are looking very long term and that's great. Uh, we do need to make sure uh, we can create these big ambitious goals in the last centuries, uh, provided we achieve them, which is another matter. Uh, but <laughs> in terms of a uh, short term, uh, that's equally important. Uh, so uh, it, it's really, really critical in terms of the storytelling uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that we do focus on uh, that micro scale. So some of the small gains we've achieved. I did a really interesting uh, survey earlier this year. So I uh, talked to about a thousand members of the public uh, and asked them a dozen multiple choice questions. Uh, so these were really, really basic in terms of what the current state of our planet is, uh, general trends of animal populations are uh, things like that and they got worse in random chance so if they had guessed they would have done better so people actually know the wrong things about what's going on in the planet and that's really interesting uh, because uh, one of the things it showed very clearly is we have a very pessimistic outlook on what's going on especially on this micro scale uh, so we've generalized trends, so we know biodiversity is declining, but that doesn't mean that some things can't be improving, if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, one of the questions was about uh, rhino poaching in South Africa, and that's halved in the past five years. Uh, quite major news, or it should be, because that's a big issue. Uh, it's going really well. Nobody's covered it, nobody knows about it, and consequently people think it's doubled, was what most said. Uh, so exact opposite answer is what came out uh, so uh, it's things like that and if you focus on some of those stories of hope uh, some of the smaller successes and think about how they can add that's uh, really what drives me what, what keeps me going day in day out in terms of these long-term sustainability dialogues uh, because we are creating some amazing change uh, we've got what 15 percent of the planet protected land surface certainly uh, the oceans a bit behind, uh, but in terms of uh, what we've done in 50 years of conservation, uh, then it really is something to be looked back upon, improved upon certainly, but admired all the more for it. Uh, one of the first uh, stories I told, uh, journalistic uh, blogging I did, uh, was about the Lazarus taxon. So Lazarus taxon is where we've got a species which we think is extinct. Uh, there's pretty good evidence, nobody can find it, often for decades, and uh, it's declared extinct, and then somebody rediscovers it much, much further down the line. Uh, so there are dozens of examples of species like this, and often they're the most strange, incredible stories about chance discoveries. Uh, so uh, very famous examples, uh, like the Colocanth, uh, deep sea fish, uh, accidentally we discovered, uh, had been thought extinct with the dinosaurs, uh, but we discovered after 400 million years, whatever it may be. Uh, so uh, there are many species, especially in recent times, uh, which have made these chance discoveries and recoveries. Uh, their populations have come back, uh, which are again, reasons for hope. Uh, we've got some of the stories of endlings. Uh, so an endling is the last animal of a species uh, before obviously it goes extinct and uh, those are what people focus on. Uh, so uh, those are the passenger pigeons, you've got Martha, uh, you've got Benjamin, the Tasmanian tiger, uh, many, many famous names, uh, George, uh, Lonesome George, uh, the Pinto Island tortoise. Uh, but these are the stories people focus on as opposed to the stories where a species have come back, Lazarus taxon. Uh, so uh, that's like a small example of uh, the way you can change the framing. Uh, but I think if you do that, uh, then that's one way in which you can definitely help to spread these messages, uh, create an impact day in, day out with the storytelling. Uh, but just about the way you talk about the issues can be really, really powerful. Wow. No, I, 
constantly when you were just talking, I was like, how many times do I do that? Where I, you know, I know in the back of my head, there's probably a good piece to something, but I just tell people, I talk about the negativity and then feel negative inside about is my work doing anything or is this collective action we're all coming together actually pooling together to move the needle forward in ocean conservation in uh, biodiversity in whatever you know space you work in so yeah just even reframing I think that's one of we haven't yet talked about that on the webinar you know the very simple thing of reframing the way you speak to others talk to others and the way that you look at the issues as well I think mm. especially our culture, our generation, even, I think we are, are so fortunate to have access to insane amounts of knowledge and insane amounts of information. And that's really privileged in a, in a lot of ways, but also can be quite um, overwhelming when you're, you're bombarded and then you only can, can pick one of that. You know, you can't spend the time dissecting all of the news. So I love that sticking with the positive, speaking positively, um, remembering that there are good things happening and there's good work that you can be doing. I think, um, I don't know about you, but I especially feel like social media is a place where, you know, I follow a lot of really amazing conservation accounts, different cool um, activists, and a lot of what I see is like, oh, no, it's getting worse. <laughs> like, oh, no. Um, but that doesn't mean like take the time to seek out really cool stuff. Don't, you know, don't turn a blind eye to the negative things happening. But, you know, it's all in the way you frame and think about it. That's I, I need to remember that that was a good a good lesson <laughs> for sure, Elliot. Um, the other thing that I think you mentioned at the beginning, you know, as much as we want to kind of get in, we're breaking into sustainability. Maybe this is the first time, you know, people watching this either now live or on YouTube are hearing about these topics. Um, what are the barriers that they're going to come into contact with? Because there are a lot of them that are movable for sure that you can punch through, kick through, and you can break them down. But what are some barriers that, um, you know, you've overcome, you've seen other people have to face and overcome that, you know, people watching should keep their eye out for. And any tips and tricks of how to knock them down would be helpful. Yeah, uh, so it's a really good question. And I've recently uh, been doing lots of mentorship uh, with other uh, social entrepreneurs in the environmental space, uh, doing uh, webinars, lecture series about overcoming these barriers because they are so, so pervasive in uh, the environmental space, uh, especially, especially for youth uh, trying to get involved. Uh, one of the big ones actually I found in uh, my work and hearing other people's stories have been credibility. Uh, so often as youth uh, is a big one uh, we come up against. Often uh, there's the stereotype of uh, well, the traditional English naturalist starting the environmental movement in many cases uh, was 70 years old uh, big bushy white beard Charles Darwin style <laughs> walked around with a monocle in his eye uh, something like that uh, but there have been uh, these sort of shadows after effects of that elitism uh, which somehow have carried over into this modern discussion of environmentalism uh, so that's a big one I know many people face up against. And in terms of how you ever, it's very much about uh, telling your story. So again, coming back to this storytelling, making sure it's unique, uh, making sure that you're articulate, know what you're fighting for, your values. Uh, we're talking about with reference to sustainability. So if you can be very clear on what it is uh, that you're fighting for, uh, why you're doing it, uh, how you're doing it, uh, then if you keep on telling people that, eventually they'll listen. Uh, there's uh, many, many marketing rules about uh, rule of seven, rule of nine, how many times you have to repeat a message to someone until they take it on board. Uh, but it's something like that. Uh, so uh, various studies have found different things. If, say, I were to repeat my elevator pitch uh, to you 10 times, uh, you'd probably get quite a good idea of what I was doing. Uh, so, I won't, but 
uh, if you can find different ways <laughs> of communicating your story of uh, the work you're doing and uh, how you want to change the world, uh, then that's a great step uh, for gaining credibility. Uh, so making sure you value yourself, trust yourself about what you're doing. Uh, gaining that self-confidence can be a really big barrier in itself to overcome, uh, but a big uh, part of gaining that credibility. As a young person, uh, obviously there are other ones. So the knowledge gap is another big one uh, we face up against. I mentioned uh, that's ever I did. Uh, so uh, the youth did just as well as the adults, uh, but often uh, they uh, feel inadequately equipped. Uh, they don't have as much experience or skills to contribute to these courses. Uh, so that's a case of taking it upon yourself to volunteer, find a worthwhile cause who will take you on. It's what Human Nature Projects is doing, uh, trying to support uh, aspiring environmentalists uh, to create a difference. Uh, there's many, many uh, emerging and existing communities like that, uh, which are creating these opportunities. Uh, so if you can find a way to make a difference and to learn those skills at the same time, uh, that's a great way of decreasing that knowledge gap. And increasingly in the modern age, uh, we get these opportunities for uh, self-taught learning as well. So uh, on online courses, MOOCs as they're called, uh, things like that, where you can uh, gain uh, both uh, the expertise, the skills, uh, but also some of that insight into what is going on. Uh, so often you'll find they're run by um, UNEP or uh, some of the big names in the space. Uh, IUCN uh, does some, uh, WWF. Uh, all of these offer uh, insight into both the work they're doing and how you can contribute in your own way. So uh, that's another way you can decrease that knowledge gap. Uh, but probably the third big one uh, would be in terms of uh, having the connections uh, to create an impact. So one I experienced very early on in my uh, career, if you want to call it that, in environmentalism was just that isolation as a youth. I've got a story I often tell about my first volunteering placement. Uh, so this was at BirdLife Australia. Uh, they've got quite a decrepit a small discovery center like mini museum uh, in one of the local parks and I used to go up there for about a year and a half uh, every month and spent the weekend volunteering uh, so taking visitors around uh, showing them about Australia's bird life. I'm an amateur bird watcher, uh, got a life list of 700 species, something like that. So I, yeah, I enjoy uh, watching birds, uh, teaching others about that, but I was the only volunteer that side of 70. Uh, it was <laughs> very stereotypical bird watchers. So retirees with these full chest harnesses to support their binoculars crouched over uh, with <laughs> drinking tea all day. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, but if that was definitely quite a hard a lesson for me to swallow in terms of what I saw there. Uh, so uh, fortunately, it opened up new doors for me. I was able to continue volunteering with different organizations, meet some more youth, uh, but gaining those connections can be uh, really challenging, but also important as a barrier to overcome. So those would be the three big ones, I think, which come to mind, uh, but there are many challenges. Uh, I think what defines the environmental space is we're also passionate about the work we do. Uh, which is why I love working in the space, uh, talking to people in so many different countries, uh, sharing expertise if I can, but learning from them just as much. And I think continuing these conversations in spaces uh, like webinars like this uh, can be just as important uh, to overcome those barriers. Yeah, those are always the three top. I think they seem obvious, but when you face them, you're like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea how do I get over this um one thing that I always say if people because I think another kind of going off what you were talking about of barriers and know it like who do you know what are your connections one of the easiest things if you are interested um but maybe haven't kind of taken those steps forward in terms of starting a project joining an organization talk to your family and friends about what you care about like Put it on Facebook, write a post, share things about the environment, share things to your Instagram stories, talk, 
check out books that are in these topics, the more that you can kind of, you know, put it out there to just even your network, I promise you, there are people who are going to be like, oh, wait, <laughs> I know somebody or I, did you know that I was friends with, like, I'll put you two together. Yeah. Like there are so many times that that's happened to me where I just post on Facebook and my aunt's friends, brother's child, like there's so many weird connections. They are like, this awesome person doing insane things and we get connected and I'm on to something else. So just put it out there. I know that might seem awkward, like telling people what you care about, but like, what else are you talking about? Like, if you don't talk about what you care about, like what else, else is there to talk about? So, you know, tell people what you care about, tell people what you're interested in. And um, especially the people in your life, I'm sure that they are more than happy to help um, connect you and, um, Kind of help you find that first easy step to getting involved so that was a really good one um please we're running how did these go so fast um we literally have four minutes if anyone has a question for elliot please obviously a super wealth of knowledge you guys are witnessing this you guys are literally seeing how on on the fly insanely brilliant he is so if you have a question please put it in the q a now um, but something that I wanted to ask you, um, just because every time we talk, you are so, you're always just, you feel like a light in this space that can feel very overwhelming and burnt out. So where do you get your, what are, where do you get your source of, you know, inspiration in moments where you are burnt out, tired of constantly knocking down barriers, tired of pushing against the brick wall? Where do you get your source of energy, source of light from? It's a really good question and it's something many, many people experience in this space uh, because ultimately we are driven by a faith, a belief that we can change the world. When things don't go right, uh, then that can be challenging. Uh, so obviously you can do these things, you can celebrate uh, small victories. Uh, but I think for me, when things get tough, I draw uh, strength from two things, uh, being the people I work with and animals themselves. So. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I love most about human nature projects, uh, doing this work I do is being able to speak with people all across the world, uh, young, aspiring, emerging leaders, uh, hear their thoughts, what drives them, uh, what keeps them going, how I can support them and uh, join them for that journey. Uh, just thinking back on uh, some of those incredible people I've worked with is something I definitely should do more often, uh, but something which gives me strength, determination uh, to keep on going. Uh, and the second one uh, being these animals. So everyone gets into this rabbit hole of environmentalism uh, just through a fascination with nature, some interest in great outdoors. Uh, it's one of those things where once you have developed that passion, uh, often it's self-perpetuating, keeps on going. So uh, making sure you return to that can be great. I do it through animal rescuing here in Sydney. So uh, something that keeps me on my feet, uh, getting call outs from members of the public, uh, whatever time of day, uh, hearing about injured wildlife uh, in need of help. Uh, so the current case we've got, and I would show you him, but he's outdoors in his cage, uh, is called Perky, the butcher bird. Uh, so... <laughs> He's absolutely adorable. Uh, he's quite young, uh, a few weeks old, uh, so uh, still being, being gape fed, uh, yeah, with mealworms, uh, some uh, baby bird food like a slush, uh, but absolutely, absolutely adorable. Uh, I imagine quite like keeping a dog, uh, but as a bird, so uh, quite charismatic, loyal, uh, trusting, uh, but absolutely wonderful creature. And I keep a, a diary, a journal, I don't know if I've got it. There you go. This is my log of all the animals I've kept in care. Let's see if I can show some to you. So, yeah, they have all uh, alongside them uh, with a short account of how they were found, uh, how it all worked out for them. As uh, I don't know, several dozen entries in there. I've just started it. Uh, but that's a beautiful way of looking back 
uh, those happy memories, uh, some of the change I've managed to make with that work and just taking the time uh, to get to know these animals we have in care. Uh, some of them will release within days, uh, some of them within weeks, uh, but that's a wonderful way for me uh, to go back to that passion, to reconnect with it. Uh, for anyone else, obviously, you can get out into nature, uh, take that time, take a walk outdoors, or learn to be an animal rescuer, uh, which is more of a full-time occupation. You can be just like Elliot and keep your own journal diary of all of the animals that you rescue. Honestly, though, that's one of the most fulfilling things. My family and I did that as a child. We found um, a baby white-tailed deer, so um, a fawn, and... Um, its mother had been um, lost and it was all alone and we took care of it. And it was one of the most like fulfilling, it, it honestly, that whole moment in life, in time is why I still yeah. do what I do because they're like, just seeing that creature and seeing its need. And um, I don't know. Anyways, I digress. It's become an animal rescuer. <laughs> like it's, it's amazing. Um, before we go, I did want to share ways that you can get involved with Elliot's work and human nature projects. Um, so let me share my awesome screen with all of you. Um, let me make this full screen so you can see it. There we go. If you are so interested in getting involved with Elliot, please do. They have so many really cool things happening at Human Nature Projects. Use your phone and your QR code to take a picture of that little QR code in the right hand corner, depending on where it shows up on your screen. Um, please get involved. Please check out his website. Please check out the things that they're doing. I was insanely inspired just researching you. That sounds so creepy, but before we were doing the, the webinar, I'm like, I want to get to know, you know, all of what you guys do. And it was extremely inspiring. So please, please, please check them out and get involved and follow them on social media. See what you can do, how you can help out. Um, but also, like I mentioned at the beginning, if you are interested in exploring ways to get involved in joining the global youth movement and other things happening, scan that QR code in the left hand side um, and you'll find um, the World Ocean Save uh, website and how you can get involved in that youth work as well. Um, but as always, you know, tell us, talk to us on social media using the hashtag rise up webinar. And what's the one thing that you're going to do to overcome the barriers to getting involved in your life? Elliot, I cannot thank you enough. This has been so fun. Where did 47 minutes go? This is why we need like hours. Although if you want more awesome Elliot Connor content, definitely give his TED talk a, a watch, his TEDx talk a watch. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me tonight um, or today, <laughs> wherever you're at. I hope you have a wonderful time um, with uh, family and friends these next couple of weeks with Thanksgiving coming up. And I hope to see you at the next one. I also did want to say for you guys watching the next, the December webinar is going to be a little sooner. So it's going to be December night. Um, so you guys will get a um, update for that, but just put that on your calendar as well. I have your that's all I have for you. Thanks again, Elliot. You're amazing. Good luck on all your adventures. Keep us posted on what you're doing. And if any of you watching has any questions, email me, DM me, um, or you have a request on future speakers as awesome as Elliot, uh, let me know. So thank you guys so much. Have wonderful evenings and I'll see you soon. Bye.